sia lodato Gesù Cristo e avanti con Maria, carissimi, vengo a darvi appuntamento dopo questa pausa estiva indimenticabile nella quale ci hanno acquisito piccola Nazareth, ma noi siamo sopravvissuti perché ci accompagna la Madonna per un appuntamento imperdibile. Domenica 6 ottobre a Milano alle ore 14.30 ci ritroviamo per quanti lo vorrete per un momento di preghiera. L'ultimo nostro raduno è stato a giugno a Firenze, una lunga estate che adesso volge al termine. Vi aspettiamo con la corona del rosario in mano, noi il popolo dei rosarianti a Milano domenica 6 ottobre prima domenica del mese dedicato alla Madonna del Rosario reciteremo insieme il Rosario accoglieremo la statua della Madonna benediremo i tutti i bambini e faremo la consacrazione alla Madonna e la recita della supplica alla Madonna del Rosario di Pompei domenica 6 ottobre Milano avanti con Maria e a presto Praise be Jesus Christ and Hail Mary Have a good and holy day to all you dear children, listening to Radio Don Minatella Nostra. Holy day in the sacred hearts of Jesus and Mary, and in the most chaste heart of Saint Joseph. Welcome back to our morning segment, Holy and Coffee. Today is Thursday, the 3rd of October, and in the traditional liturgical calendar, the one we follow, because we have decided years ago, as you know, to celebrate the Betta Sordo Mass. Today is the liturgical feast of Saint Teresa of the Child Jesus and the Holy Face, while in the Novus Ordo, as you know, it is celebrated on the 1st of October. Sooner or later, as Benedict XVI hoped, there should be a reform of the reform meaning that especially some feasts like these could find agreement between the Novus and Vedas liturgical calendars, finding a common ground because it would be nice, for example, if St. Teresa were celebrated on the same day in both the Novus and Vedas Ordo. Anyway, in the Novus Ordo, it is celebrated and commemorated, although as von Balthasar would say, it is not the saints who are celebrated and commemorated, but Jesus Christ, their first October. While in the Vedas, her feast is today, the 3rd of October. She died on the 30th of September, 1897, but in a moment we will talk about her as the title says, as the title states, I will be love, Saint Teresa of Jesus of the Andes. See, I will be love is in quotation marks because I believe, having read it several times, a couple of times, the story of a soul, that this expression, in my opinion, I will try to justify it. The decisive one for understanding the charisma and mission that God entrusted to Saint Therese of the Child Jesus, who is so dear to all of us. Meanwhile, today is Thursday, so this evening at 9 o'clock, there is the Catechesis from my book The Symphony of the Lamb, a book you can request if you wish to the Secretariat of Radio Dominutella Nostra, and which you will find available in Milan, as we will now say, the Kyrios addresses the churches of Smyrna and Pergamum. We are examining the imperial septenary. Last Thursday we meditated, because these are true meditations, on the message. Do you remember that the Kyrios gave to the church of Ephesus your first love? That one, recover it, you don't have it anymore. Reflect on how our love for Jesus is. Christ for the Lord. This evening, we will instead look at my book, The Symphony of the Lamb, a series of catechesis commenting on the Apocalypse. There are seven letters in total, and tonight we will examine Smyrna and Pergamum together. I expect you at nine o'clock in the evening. This is the post with the same photo as last Thursday. And this is not good because otherwise people get confused. The Kyrios addresses the churches of Smyrna and Pergamum. Share. Share at 9 o'clock on the YouTube channel of Radio Domina Nostra, where I invite you to like and subscribe if you haven't done so. Then let's thank God for the biblical catechesis last night by Brother Celestino, which had significant viewership, with the peak, the peak reaching around 1,700. These are remarkable numbers, remarkable numbers. It was a commentary on the Gospel for next Sunday, from the Gospel of John. Naturally, 
You can find it in the playlist of Radio Nostra, on the YouTube channel of Radio Nostra, where you can find the so-called playlist, meaning all the programming already done and that can be accessed when missed for various reasons. And so, all the catechesis are broadcast live each time, but then they are also available, as we are saying, on the playlist. Go to the website, scroll through the schedule, and the channel will easily show you the most recent live broadcasts. All right, so there are three days left until the prayer meeting in Milan. Just three now. These are crucial days. Let's hope the weather is more forgiving. Anyway, we are indoors, just to say, at the NH Milano Congress Center Hotel in Asago, Milano Fiori. There will be this moment of grace with the presence of the priests of the Sodalizio, which, as I said yesterday, doesn't take much to bring you all here, for reasons of arithmetic. While this morning at breakfast, we were watching the cardinals, the bishops around the false pope. All right. Well, we must be patient. As we know, I was telling you, at 10.30, confessions will be held until 12.30. At exactly, I don't want to hear any excuses, please. 12.30, confessions, stop on time. We priests withdraw for a briefing, as they say, a coffee break, or coffee break is better. And then after at 2.30, the actual meeting begins. The program is very intense, as you can see, and you can see it to my left, the reception of the statue of Our Lady of Fatima, then the Holy Rosary, the consecration to Our Lady, the supplication to Our Lady of the Rosary of Pompeii, because in three days it is the first Sunday of October, the beginning of this month dedicated to the Rosary, and then the blessing of children from zero to twelve years old. Here, we will give them a little memento for this moment of grace we will experience. And later, there will be the Holy Mass celebrated by Father Johannes with the homily by Don Erico and the Eucharistic procession led by Brother Celestino. At the end of the Eucharistic blessing, there will also be the blessing of the sacramentals, water, oil, salt, and so on, a moment of grace and prayer at the end. As a criterion of reparation also for the abomination happening in Rome, as we will see in a moment, to keep us updated about the cursed synod, the synod of Santa. They've gone back to gathering again with King Arthur's round tables. Yesterday there was a speech by Fernandez Besame Mucho, the so-called prefect, who is supposed to safeguard the faith. Dear children, we are in complete chaos. I said this yesterday and I reiterate it. We're at madness now. Tuccio Fernandez is one of those who should defend and safeguard the deposit of faith, the apostolic tradition. All right, do as you please, someone used to say. All right, yesterday, the person in question spoke up. It wasn't a long segment where he said that we shouldn't in my own words, we shouldn't ordain deaconesses of some, he said interesting, he mentioned deaconesses of some, I wouldn't want it to have been a Freudian slip of some, now I'll tell you why, of some deaconesses, a slogan in this synod, because the time is not yet ripe. All right, it's a subtle, diabolical way for the partisans of Santa to say two things. The first, that in the end it will happen, because if it's not ripe now, it's like when someone has to go picking, since the olive season is approaching, not here in Lombardy, of course, but from Tuscany downwards. And then the expert looks at the olive tree and understands if it's the right time to harvest. No? He turns and says it's unripe. What's unripe mean? Wait, we'll catch him in a bit. Christ? All right, it's already a message, because those who are Freemasons act with these criteria here. Christ, messages on the Overton window, subliminal messages. The time is not ripe yet. And for heaven's sake, someone who is the prefect of faith should say that it's not possible to ordain women. Jesus Christ did not want it. The apostolic tradition prevents it. The church has never done it. 
We cannot, we must not, we do not want to. The time is not ripe yet, because they speak the same way then. Incredible, it seems like a cloning of Bergoglio Fernandez. They talk alike, see, they speak the same. The time is not ripe yet. How is the time not ripe? You, wretches! What do you mean? The project is to go against the foundational will of Jesus Christ, because there is no mature time, no dogma, no... All right, I'll reiterate this once more to you. Dear children of Chirios, you must be patient with me, but I'm doing this for you, because now, once again, I'm being targeted. Who knows why when I leave, and there are gatherings step by step, Don Minutella is targeted. All right? All right, I want to say this. The problem for these wretches, I'm not talking about the Satanist leaders in the Vatican, but the poor pathetic worms around them, the court sycophants. The problem is Dominatella with his speeches, Dominatella making money, Dominatella even dividing the church. The story of St. Athanasius is being repeated. St. Athanasius is me. The story of St. Athanasius is being repeated. So I am the one dividing the church, not Bergoglio, who is not the Pope and is going against the deposit of faith. I am the one who divides it as I shout the truth, which is that never ever, as it was written, which also means going against the more recent popes. Because if it were a dogmatic fact of the past, in the end, one could still try to discuss it if there's a flop, as they say, a cut. Chronologically in history, it's a continuum up to John Paul II, who said that never ever will the church be able to ordain women as priests. When yesterday, at the first session of the Synod, Fernandez says, who expects this? Otherwise they spread rumors around, don't worry, at Bergoglio, Bruno Pontiff. But she didn't write this thing about wanting the convention. Don't worry, I'll handle it. Otherwise you know what a mess they'll make. All right, the word's out. Lancelot came, Guinevere, it was supposed to be King Arthur's round table, those things saying, don't worry me, otherwise what a mess they'll make. It's just a way to take the mickey to mess around. This is what they're doing, not to me, I hope to someone else among you. I will never let myself be taken for a fool by these people. I might just make a fool of them, God willing. I won't be taken for a ride. Am I alone? All right, I'm here. I'm here. God's will is done. They have already circulated it, naturally not to Mueller, because a couple, but not many, I don't know, maybe not even 10, more than 300 synod fathers. Those who disagree with the reforms, the others said, calm down, keep calm, we'll handle it. The time is not ripe yet. So it means we will do it, because if the olive is not ripe, it's still there, and sooner or later it ripens and is picked. So, Fernandez, if you want to say, be patient, the time will come when we will do it. But this, I repeat, is going against the deposit of faith and therefore against the foundational will of Jesus Christ. This is the Antichrist. This is the Antichrist. In the Vatican's Hall of Nervi, the Prefect of Faith says that sooner or later they will go against the will of Christ. This is the Antichrist. I don't want to hear any more about mystics scattered around the world when they say he'll come here, he'll come there, he'll do this, he'll do that. The Antichrist is already here. When the so-called prefect of the faith, the number one defender of the deposit of faith, sits in the Nervi Hall during a synod in the presence of the Pope, let's assume it's all true, and says that on the invoice, and on the matter of the ordination of women. It's not the right time yet. The time isn't ripe. So it's said that this moment will come. Dear children, it's not that he said he's sorry for those who are innovators, those who are modernists, progressives, antichrists scattered across the universe. 
But there is a foundational will of Jesus Christ. There is a 2,000-year-old deposit of faith, an uninterrupted tradition of apostolic origin, because it dates back to the apostles, who, as von Balthasar says, are the normative element in the life of the Church. Therefore, it's not possible to ordain women understood. It's not possible to ordain women. Naturally, this is the most dear children that one can think because, I repeat, it's a slow process. Do you remember the boiled frog? The process of the boiled frog is a slow process that evidently brings its effects. What are the effects? That they are all dazed, to say the least. Those who are in the Vatican are all dazed. I can't believe. I can't believe that we all agree. The idea, if it were so, perhaps it would even be better, but I can't believe it. Let's suppose, for example, that the prefect of the congregation for fishing thinks like this, all of them. Do the theologians of Rome, the professors of theological universities, think like that? I can't believe it. And so what happens then? They bow their heads. They submit to Santa's power. They do this, dear kids. All right, I had prepared the link to view from the Facebook profile Siler Non Possum, where there's the label Vatican News. Here, about 40 seconds of Fernandez's speech. I don't know if there are issues with us regarding, how do you say, what's that thing about control anyway? What? Of copyright, I don't think so, because we take it from another site that publishes it. So now, in a few moments, the director who acquires it will show it to you. Then there are about 40 seconds in which the prefect in faith, man of God, man of Christ, man of the Church, says what you will now hear that I have commented on and this much more. Fiori must commit you to come to Milan. You know that you are the true strength, those who listen to me, those of the small remnant. The true strength is not Dominutella. The true strength is you. Because indeed they do not speak of you. They do not speak of you when you gather with Dominutella and with brothers three to four thousand people. Because why don't they speak? True power is you. Come to Milan, show everyone that Dominatella has a following, that it's the remnant that doesn't bow to the Antichrist dictatorship. Perhaps the contribution is ready. Follow it very carefully. The opportunity remains open. An in-depth exploration, but in the mind of the Holy Father, there are other topics still to be explored and resolved before rushing to discuss a possible diaconate for some women. Otherwise, the diaconate becomes a kind of consolation for some women and the more decisive issue of women's participation. There you go, you've listened. The contribution is very brief. You might have noticed a couple of things. First of all, for me, the most relevant thing is that this is not a synod. It's not a synod. It's not like the so-called Pope Francis keeps insisting, we must dialogue, we must listen to the grassroots. What did the number two hierarch just finish saying? The Pope doesn't want this topic. See, as Bergoglio commands. Can we listen to it again, please? Let's listen to it carefully, and then, thank God, we move on to St. Teresa. A deeper analysis by the pontiff, who does not consider the issue mature. The opportunity for further exploration remains open, but in the mind of the Holy Father, there are other topics that need to be explored and resolved before rushing to discuss a potential diaconate for some women. 
Otherwise, the diaconate becomes a kind of consolation for some women and a more decisive issue. Participation of women. We later learned from one of our collaborators that Fernandez went to confess because he sinned against synodality. As he said, it's a matter that deserves to be explored further, but the issue is not yet mature in the mind of the Holy Father. Of the Synodalists series, you're the first ones. We're making fun of, here we are in charge, here we do what the false prophet wants, here we do what the false prophet wants, on behalf of the Declaration. I'm afraid, dear children, as I had foretold you, the second phase of the Synod is proving to be even more significant. Because then, and to conclude, we go to St. Teresa, because I want to talk a little about her today, at least in the second part of this morning's segment, Saint and Coffee, because there is a splendor of Catholicism that, thank God, neither Bergoglio nor Fernandez, both Argentinians, both from there, from Buenos Aires, I wonder what that could mean. I was saying there's a splendor in Catholicism that, thank God, these people can't diminish at all, because today is St. Teresa, tomorrow is also, among other important commemorations, St. Francis of Assisi, patron of Italy, and on Saturday it's St. Faustina Kowalska, and also Blessed Bartolo Longo, so the saints from heaven, you see, they help us. We are in the truth, you see, who, as Fra Celestino said last Sunday in Lecce, this is not a political ideological movement, but we are in the truth. It is a light that reaches us, for which one is then ready for any sacrifice, at any cost, at any price, just to move forward. Come to Milan, then. All right, I was saying that the last thing I wanted to mention is this. In the end, the message is conveyed. That's the most important thing. The timing is set by the Pope, not you. You just need to serve the propaganda, insist, here in this synod, a couple of pythonesses must work to make people believe that it's not right for women to be discriminated against in the church. This two-phase synod is working so that there is no discrimination, that no one is discriminated against, homosexuals, the LGBT community, and now women. The sins against synodality, doctrine hurled like a stone, this is the grotesque, mocking situation of Italian comedy unfolding in the Vatican, where it strikes me. The foolish obsequiousness of cardinals and bishops, not all of them, because some are on their side. But don't tell me Comastri does it out of love for the church. Because last night I listened to Father Livio in a personal moment. They told me he spoke about how the visionaries now have to keep quiet, that even the ten secrets must go through the hands of the apostolic visitor. But wasn't Father Livio the first to say we must be careful not to be manipulated? We need to make a move, even Father Petar now, everyone aside because Alora Cavalli appears. Alora Cavalli's appearance, the apostolic visitor. Father Livio justified everything by saying that this is done for the love of the Church, love for the Holy Father, obedience, etc. Attention to this trap that Freemasonry has studied for at least half a century. Prepared this thing here without any rush. Induced deception lead to hell. Under the pretext that there's the Church, there's the obey the Pope. And so that's why the priestly alliance of Mary is persecuted. Don Erico no longer appears in the broadcasts, except for the Biblical Wednesday, because he has been reduced to the lay state. What did Don Erico do wrong? Bergoglio's not the Pope, which Masonic powers in the Vatican oppose. All this is happening while a war has now been declared between Israel and Iran, 
which I remember since I was little, this war has always been considered even much worse than the one between Russia and Ukraine. Because all the Arab states are involved. Avremo quindi due fronti per nulla tranquilli, voglio dire per nulla innocui, due fronti di guerra, per nulla limitati, come dire regionalizzati. The first front is the Ukrainian-Russian one. If it's true that Putin and Foreign Minister Lavrov have said that if it turns out that the United Nations offers long-range missiles, which can therefore hit Russian cities and villages, and NATO has offered this, they have said it is total war. And on the other side, Iran, you know that the Arab world is not Islamic, it's not all united. In the Arab world there are Shia and Sunni, and so there it can also become total chaos. Dear children, this is the moment. Let's hold the rosary crown in our hands and move forward without confusion. Let's meet on Sunday because it's very nice to be together. Let's show everyone that Bergoglio is not the Pope, that it is the false church of darkness that Teresa Emmerich spoke about. And now that's clear to everyone. Well, now these last minutes, about 20 minutes, I want to dedicate to St. Teresa of the Child Jesus. Today in the Vedas Ordo, as I said at the beginning, it's her feast. I would like to ask the director to broadcast the photo. This is the classic one of St. Teresa. I also have it at my home in a large format. See St. Teresa, what an intense gaze. She was a Carmelite nun. No introduction needed for St. Teresa of the child Jesus because she was a nun, perhaps the most beloved saint. Between the 800s and 900s, there's no doubt. There is no doubt that St. Teresa said during her short life, having died at 24 in the monastery, I've been there a couple of times in Lisieux, died at 24, yet she used to say, I will spend my heaven doing good to souls, to do good on earth. It truly is so. Many thanks and many vocations, even of other saints to come, were formed at Teresa's school. Teresa is a leader. He is a leader. He is an Abrahamic figure, a kind of founder of a new Christian orientation, because the one before her, which would have otherwise remained the same, was already quite rusty from too much legalism. Before her, there was an anti-Lutheran vision that focused excessively on human merits. You must earn paradise, you must become a saint, you must, you must. However, the risk was that in this, you must become a saint, you must earn heaven, you must avoid sin, you must earn merits, you must avoid purgatory, and so on. There was first of all a bit of discouragement for those who couldn't manage it. And then especially there was a theological risk of focusing too much on human initiative. It wasn't wrong. But the excess occurred from the 1500s to the 1800s, that's 300 years, from the post-Lutheran era to the 1800s when St. Teresa lived. Catholic spirituality was like this. You must become a saint. You must become a saint with your efforts, with your merits. Teresa introduces a new approach. What seems new in the church must always be consistent with the heritage of faith. Teresa, you see, rediscovers the primacy of God's grace. Without denying the contribution of merits, because otherwise she would have gone too far. However, he says that the primacy belongs to the grace of God. It's a revolution in the church. And from that moment, Teresa becomes dear. A generation, ours from the 20th century, made up of weak Catholics, Catholics without more than just impulses, in my opinion. And it may be debatable, but that's how I see it. And Catholics aiming for a holiness not like St. Francis of Assisi or St. Benedict, etc., but a holiness more, in quotes, within reach, because no one is truly 
perfect, and so she is truly a pioneer. It's as if God had said to Teresa instead of Abraham, Abraham, leave your land and go to the house. He had said to Teresa, 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 leave your house, meaning your vision, towards a path that I will show you. It's the way of petitesse, as it's said in French. However, Convalta wrote a masterpiece book on Teresa's spirituality because everyone has studied her. Psychiatrists, theologians, doctors, everyone, anthropologists, sociologists, all have been captivated by the charm of this young Norman. And even today, just from the photos, she is irresistible. It's as if she is alive. Look at her, read her, invoke her, feel her beside you. Progenitor. That's it. She comes with an imposing range from the sky. Why? God willed it. Why choose Abe, not Lot? Why Ur of the Chaldeans and not Babylon? God. Teresa has a power granted to her by God, which didn't come cheap as we will now see, immeasurable because she is a pioneer. I will now present you with some evidence. Think of our time saints. You know I teach faith heroes on Saturday nights. Almost everyone was devoted to Saint Therese of the Child Jesus. The mystics of our time, but this photo compels me to pause. This photo here of Teresa. I saw that dress in Lisieux. She made it herself, with her own hands, because she was a woman then. She didn't have time to, because they had proposed she become a deaconess, and she said no. All right, she's made herself this outfit. She's putting on a little skit, a comedy, about St. Joan of Arc. She wrote the script herself. Goodness me. I say that monastery must have been a party, because Teresa was extraordinary, always smiling, joyful, radiant, despite, as we will now see, the trial God subjected her to. Because a calling is a trial. Election is peresmos. Because Abraham sacrifices your son. Do you remember the son Isaac? Therese too, as we will see now, has walked the royal path of the cross. But in a moment, I want to say here, therefore it is a revolution of thought that of Teresa in the same way as the theological one, always of the 20th century, carried out by de Lubac and von Balthasar in particular, the one that mistakenly went down in history under the name of Nouvelle Theologie. Until that moment, theology was taught by Thomists, Scholastics, and Neothomists, but it was a theological model that had become worn out, no longer aligned with the reality of modernity. Von Balthasar and de Lubac are also, like Teresa, revolutionaries. They reintroduced the Church Fathers with a new theological vision that was later endorsed by Pope John Paul II and even earlier by Paul VI. Back to Teresa. Where lies this greatness, the genius of Teresa? The genius of Therese, as someone wrote. The genius of Teresa was in this thing here. Relinquishing the primacy to God who acts in our lives, it's He who does everything. And Teresa recounts an episode in that work which is a worldwide bestseller. I'm talking about Story of a Soul. I believe it's among the most read books in the world to this day. Ah, I'm telling you about modern saints. Mother Teresa of Calcutta began her work. She took the name Teresa, Mother Teresa of Calcutta, because her name was, I think, Anna. She took the name Saint Agnes. She took the name Teresa because she wanted to be inspired by the little way of Saint Teresa. Charles de Foucault did the same, and many other saints of our time, almost all, have drawn from her spirituality, more than spirituality, from the revolutionary message of Saint Teresa. I won't recount it to you because you already know it and because it's very long. A special in-depth analysis would be needed. I want to highlight two points. Here, this is another picture of Teresa. These are photos, not pastel portraits. They're photos. As I was saying, I want to say two things about Teresina. 
First of all, the struggle to find her vocation in the church, and here this is all very relevant. Teresa was a French woman, a religious discalced Carmelite nun in seclusion. When she read the lives of the martyrs, they seemed to her not like us, because we say, how can one die like that? But instead, because she writes in a text something of theirs, which I have included in one of my books. I don't remember which one, but at this moment she writes in one of her texts how she would like to die flayed like Saint Bartholomew, as we would like. And then, since it was the period when there were French missionaries at the end of the 19th century, this is an emblematic photo of Teresina, because what you see in her hand is the wedding invitation she made herself. She wrote it in the story of a soul, you can find it there. She made herself the wedding invitation. Jesus of Nazareth and Teresa of Lisieux announced their marriage, guests will be invited. She created that whole story there. But here you see in her face, she is already in the crucifying phase. You can understand it very well, pale and emaciated, because as we will see now, she offered herself as a victim to merciful love. All right, let's get back to what I was saying. She heard the story of the martyrs who went to die as French missionaries, of the foreign French missions in Vietnam. In China, for example, I think his name was Theophine Venard, who was a French martyr who died young in Vietnam in a terrible way through enormous tortures. And Teresa suffered because she was in the monastery and was searching for her own path. She wanted to understand that she wanted to be everything. She wanted to be everything. I'll read Teresa's line. I would like to die flayed like St. Bartholomew, like St. John. I would like to be immersed in boiling oil. I would like to endure all the inflicted tortures and martyrdoms. All of them, eh? With St. Agnes and St. Cecilia, I'd offer my neck to the... How is it possible that a life like this is so loved then? God wanted it. It was a mission. I would like to offer my neck to the sword, and like Joan of Arc, my beloved sister, I would wish to whisper your name, O Jesus, on the pyre. Thinking of the torments that will be reserved for Christians in the time of the Antichrist, I feel my heart leap and wish those torments were reserved for me. This is Teresa's record. All right, she is searching for her path, and at a certain point, she falls into a deep crisis because she can't find it. She can't understand what her journey should be. Let's read from the autobiography. Writes at a certain point, since my immense aspirations were a torment for me, because she saw that the Lord placed them within her, she wanted to die a martyr, wanted to become a missionary, wanted to be a doctor of the church, but she couldn't live any of these charisms. Martyrdom, then. I turned to the letters of St. Paul for her. If you want, you can also read the texts of Tuccio Fernandez. It doesn't change, or Bergoglio's. I turned to the letters of St. Paul to finally find an answer. My eyes fell by chance on chapters 12 and 13 by chance, but he means to say that there is divine providence. Are there priests who oppose opening the Bible? Can't get it. Why criticize opening the Bible for a sign from God? Do it if you want to. It's an act of faith. They say it's a magical act, a superstitious, superstitious act. No, no, no. If done with faith, the Lord answers. Sorry, it's God's word. All right, Teresa did it. So I stumbled upon chapters 12 and 13 of the first letter to the Corinthians and read in the first that not everyone can be apostles, prophets, teachers, deacons at the same time. No, it isn't written. The church is made up of various members and the eye cannot simultaneously be the hand. A response certainly clear, but not such as to pay for my desires and give me peace. He still couldn't find peace with his calling in the church. Keep writing. I continued reading and didn't lose heart. I found a phrase that gave me relief reads the text of St. Paul and reads with aspiration. St. Paul says, aspire to the greater gifts and I will show you a way better than all others. 1 Corinthians 12.31
adds the race. The apostle indeed declares that even the greatest gifts are nothing without charity, and that this very charity is the most perfect way that leads securely to God. I had finally found peace. This is a foundational text. Maria's capital's worth this. This is a paradigmatic text. I'd say it's even normative. The strictness that then... John Paul II, I was there, a seminarian in St. Peter's Square. He made her doctor of the church. Therese is also a doctor of the church, as well as the patroness of missions. She made it. I had finally found peace. Now she explains it. In the church's mystical body, I found myself in none of St. Paul's members, but wanted to see myself in all. She couldn't see herself as the doctor, nor as the missionary, nor as the pastor, and so on and so forth. She wanted to find herself in all vocations. Charity offered me the cornerstone of my vocation. I understood that the church has a body made up of various members, but in this body the necessary and most noble member cannot be missing. I understood that the church has a heart, a heart burning with love. Understood that only love spurs the members of the church into action, and that without this love, the apostles would no longer proclaim the gospel, the martyrs would no longer shed their blood. I understood and realized that love encompasses all vocations, that love is everything, that it extends to all times and places, in a word that love is eternal. All right, with great joy and ecstasy of the soul, I cried out, O oh Jesus, my love, I have finally found my vocation. My vocation is love. But we get the shivers, don't we? Speaking of deaconess, keep those scoundrels away. Women, don't, don't let yourselves be ideologized by this anti-Christian ideology that goes against the foundational will of Christ. Teresa didn't need to go to the altar to celebrate. Let's wrap up this section. O oh Jesus, my love, I have finally found my vocation. My vocation is love. How beautiful she is. That's why Teresa is so great in the eyes of God. You barely have time to call her or think of her, and she comes to your side. Some time ago, I decided to do something. Now you'll try to believe it. All right, I won't tell you. It's something Teresa did for me that is simply amazing. I don't know whether to say it or not. My vocation is love. Yes. I have found my place in the church. Two points. Deaconess? No. Priestess? No. No. Consultant of the Vatican Dicastery of the... No. Theologian? No. What? What only a woman can particularly identify because she is a woman. My place in the church, this place you have given me, O oh my God. In the heart of the church, my mother, I knew love. I imagine the fathers of the church, the apostles, the patriarchs, the martyrs in heaven, all at a certain point. I see it. I really see it from heaven. As soon as she wrote that, from heaven they leaned down because the eternal father wanted to bestow upon this small, this small great woman who died so young, a sort of divine sovereignty. Incalculable, even the Muslims venerate her. In a mosque, I think in Egypt, right in Cairo, they wanted to place a memorial for Teresa. She is loved all over the world. From the church bells, my mother, I shall be love. It's a song of glory, a melody, a symphony, a mystical, symphonic, immeasurable overture. Heart of the church, my mother, I will be love, and in this way I will be everything.
and my desire will become reality. Here we could say so many things about Teresa, but I must say the last part. Abram, Abram, leave your land towards the sign of Nikiero. Teresa, Teresa, leave your land for a new form of Christian message, of spirituality, the smallness, the littleness. She recounts an episode. Since she heard it said that, as it was said then, those who pray even at night, I'm giving an example. But she provides these examples, become closer to God. She tried, but she couldn't do it. She fell asleep. She tells it. During the day, she'd nod off in choir as sisters handed them over. It was pointless from past sanctity's view. She heard people say that she did what the nuns did too, because I saw the instruments of penance she had, and mind you, she wasn't Lutheran, and she did penance herself too. But he felt it was forced. Then she starts telling it. Imagine, because Teresa was brilliant. Teresa's, the genius of Teresa, the genius of Teresa. Tell an anecdote, Teresa makes it up herself. Tell about a hunting trip where a wealthy knight, and at a certain point in the woods, spots a white rabbit. Listen to what Teresa is capable of writing, only she could have written these things. While the hunter is about to shoot the rabbit, the rabbit turns and looks at him and realizes that for him, for the rabbit, Teresa is over. And then it leaps and jumps onto him to curl up in his arms. The knight, who was supposed to shoot him and then have a lavish meal, is moved by this act of love that the little bunny did with its tiny ears, settling right there, you know, inside, with its little fluffy tail wiggling all over, he softens. And not only does he not kill it, but he orders all his followers that no one should harm this little bunny. In fact, he decides to take it home so they can play with it. Had Teresa seen it? The hunter who wants to shoot is divine justice. I say, Teresa, I know that this divine justice can only be overcome through the path of humility, tenderness, and love. I then leap on to the justice of God. Look, it's a bold thing. If you allow me, if you permit me, I'd like to tell you that, quote-unquote, don't misunderstand me. The Almighty made him pay for it, though. Eh? Please understand what I mean. The Almighty said, ah, yes, I'll put these feelings inside you, but now see what price you have to pay. You won't get away with it, you know? I'm free now. All right, Teresa and the little rabbit, who throws herself into the arms of divine justice to transform it into tenderness, into love, into mercy. Get the revolution? This thing's amazing. However, at a certain point, Teresa enters a final phase. She will die on the 30th of September, 1897, at 24 years old. At 22 years old. 22 years old, mind you. An important age, where generally a woman is already mature for true love. Not the impulses she experienced that we have brought, what are they, incalculable. But because it's God's work in us, for example, I see it in myself. Many compare me, but how do you do it? But you have no idea what God puts inside me in this mission. I believe it is nothing different from what he put inside Teresa. Otherwise, it's madness. It's the grace of God working within you. When I listen to souls, there are many who are just chatterboxes, but there are souls in whom I see, perceive the work of God, and I bow before this. When they feel the need to suffer for the love of God, they embrace the cross with joy, rejoice in the sufferings, and await the cross. You can understand, this is another photo of Therese, when she performs the play of St. Joan of Arc, which pleased all the sisters in the convent in the monastery of Lisieux. All right, at 22 years old, we're heading towards the conclusion, Therese offers herself as a victim. She offers herself as a victim, but not to divine justice. Here is the paradigm shift. Until that moment, one offered oneself as a victim to appease God. Sins of the world. No, 
She offers herself, it had never happened before, as a victim to the mercy of God for two reasons. The first, to save sinners and sanctify the priests. When she arrived at the monastery, even today it's still done this way, in the cloister, the nuns with the mother are at the entrance and welcome. And she, the girl who enters, is embraced by each one because the family what did Teresa do? I told her, she came in, slipped away, and went straight to the tabernacle saying to Jesus, that's how it's done, guys. Eh. Hey guys, daughters seized, that's how. She went before the tabernacle and said, Jesus, I'm here because I want to become a saint. She went to Jesus first. Then she returned, told her mom, her sister, sorry mom, but God first. If you read her life, it's incredible. It's incredible the acts of love that Jesus gives her throughout her life. As she offers herself as a victim to merciful love. You must know, for the first 23 and a half years of her life, every journey of faith she took, she felt the Lord beside her. When you feel the Lord with you, you have joy of suffering becomes tabor mysterious this thing but that's how it is when you have the lord by your side like the martyrs who face the tortures the torments yet they have the lord they feel the joy of suffering for them it's an indescribable joy that cannot be explained one evening, it's the night between Maundy Thursday and Good Friday of 1890. 1896, I think, 1896. Therese is 23 and a half years old. And she notices that blood is coming out of her mouth. So much blood. And then she says she took the handkerchief, wiped herself, and decided to go to her little cell. In the cell, she sits down, another gasp, and again, so much blood from her mouth. They call these hemoptysis. There are blood discharges that are a symptom of an advanced stage of tuberculosis, which in the past was fatal. Teresa decides to lie down. She lies down on the straw mattress, and again an abundant hemoptysis of blood, the third one. She writes this. Heard, the Lord had answered me, and I felt immense joy. In a short span of time, Therese has to take to her bed, loses her strength, complete weakness, and heads towards death. Spends her days in the infirmary like a person utterly useless. She can no longer join the choir. She can no longer pray. Her time is spent plucking petals from roses to give to Jesus. At a certain point, however, Teresa experiences the sacrifice of Abraham because she is a leader, a progenitor of a host of souls, Teresa. So, at a certain moment, the light goes out. Now here truly we enter, dear children, into the mystery. The light goes out. Therese becomes an atheist in the sense that she must live a condition of faith as if God does not exist. The dark night. There is in Teresa's writings that section called Novissima Verba. All her sayings from the month of June, July until the 30th of September when she wishes. In the final phase of his life, it's the climax. Therese asks to remove meds, thinking of suicide. Therese asks her mother if this is the agony of dying, 
What will death itself be like? She must struggle against herself to not lose faith. The Lord was crucifying, stripping her completely of herself. Combatas wrote that masterpiece there which I invite you to read, Sisters in the Spirit, where he says this is the transformation from a personal existence to a theological existence, the charisma. He says there is no subjective mysticism, where objective mysticism in favor of the church. Teresa is about to be transformed into a masterpiece, but it is total darkness, it is anguish, it is agony, the hours passing inexorably for a young girl in an anonymous monastery in Normandy who is dying, who knows she is dying, and who no longer even knows what will happen to her, so she must make continuous acts of faith, because for her it is as if God does not exist. And continuous acts of love, because she wants to believe that this God who now strikes her so, and whom she cannot explain, is still the God she loves. And so we reach that 30th of September, 1897, after, as we will see, the apotheosis where she, until the very last moment before dying, is there fighting. And we cannot measure this struggle of what I think and feel. Teresa has accumulated and associated upon herself countless trials and torments of martyrs throughout the ages. I don't think it's possible to fully measure the degree of spiritual agony that Therese experienced. As she was dying, he uttered those final words, In the heart of the church, my mother will be love. In the heart of the church, my mother will be love. And as she was breathing her last, her final words were, Oh, my God, I love you my God. She died with an act of love. Here, this photo is paradigmatic. See Therese, who is dying. She passed away recently. Look at her face, already reassured as if by the glory of heaven on earth. A climax. No saint, no holy person has ever had what she had. The book Story of a Soul has been translated into all the languages of the world, with millions of copies read across the planet. Lisieux has become one of the spiritual homes of Roman Catholicism. A pontifical basilica has been built. The popes have bowed before Teresa. Pius XI proclaimed her a saint. John Paul II made her the patronus of missions, she who never left the monastery. John Paul II declared her a doctor of the church. There is no corner of the Catholic world where the saint of roses, like Saint Rita, is not invoked, prayed to. Her image has become dear and familiar to all Catholics around the world. May Saint Teresa from heaven intercede for all of us and for this Sunday's meeting. It is the moment when, more than ever, dear flowers, we must not give in but resist this malevolent disgrace that is in the Vatican of the false church of darkness. And may the Lord forgive all those who, on behalf of their beloved Pope Francis, who is not a pope, come against me, slandering me, offending me, throwing the humiliation of slander upon me. May the Lord forgive them. I pray for them to repent, because they risk seriously losing their souls. Now let's answer the first phone call. I remind you this evening at 9 o'clock for Ola Catechesis on the Apocalypse. Here's the post that's now being shown. The Chirios addresses the churches of Smyrna and Pergamum from my book The Symphony of the Lamb, which is always available, just like in Milan. We will make available my latest two works, which are the eagle and the sun, that is the first volume commenting on the Gospel of John, the first five chapters of Alexandrian origin, and then, and then, and then after the other is, I don't remember anymore the other, the false church of its destiny in a new edition.